Hello and welcome back to Classic Books. Jamie, Lily, Star, and Chloe, and Bella. I just got tapped by Jamie's tail, but as always, I want to remind you to please stay safe, healthy, hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, and the notification bell. And we're going to get back into Pet Cemetery by Stephen King's chapter, and we're on chapter 27. Without further ado, let's get there. Okay, chapter 27, Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. All right, so let me get there. Open up the book here. Lewis didn't really know he was drunk until he got back in his own garage. Outside there was starlight and a chilly rind of moon. Not enough light to cast a shadow, but enough to see by. Once he got in the garage, he was blind. There was a little switch somewhere, but he was damned if he could remember anymore just where it was. He felt his way along slowly, shuffling his feet, his head swimming, anticipating a painful crack on the knee or a toy that he would stumble over, frightening himself with its crash, perhaps falling over himself, Ellie's little Schwinn Schwin with its red training wheels, Gage's crawly gator. Where was the cat? Had he left him in? Somehow he sailed off course and ran into the wall. A splinter whispered into one palm and he cried out shit into the darkness realizing after the word was out that it sounded more scared than mad. The whole garage seemed to have taken a stealthy half-turn. Now it wasn't just the light switch. Now he didn't know where the fuck anything was, and that included the door onto, into the kitchen. He began walking again, moving slowly, his palms stinging. This is what it would be like to be blind, he thought. And that made him think of a Stevie Wonder concert he and Rachel had gone to. When, six years ago? I hurt my eye. I mean, I was panicking. I thought I was going to be blind. Well, at least temporarily. As impossible as it seemed, it had to be. She had been pregnant with Ellie then. Two guys had led Wonder to a synthesizer, guiding him over the cables that snaked across the stage so he wouldn't stumble. And later, when he had gotten up to dance with one of the backup singers, she had led him carefully to a clear place on the floor. He had danced well, Lewis remembered thinking. He had danced well, but he had needed a handle and lead him to the space where he could do it, do it. How about a hand right now to lead me to my kitchen door, he thought, and abruptly shuddered. The hand came out of the darkness now to lead him. How he would scream, scream, and scream, and scream. He stood still here, stood still, heart thudding. Come on, he told himself, stop this, this shit. Come on, come on. Where was that fucking cat? Then he did slam into something, the rear bumper of the station wagon, and the pain sang up his body from his bark chin. Making his eyes water, he grabbed his leg and rubbed it, standing one leg legged like a heron, but at least he knew where he was. Now the geography of the garage fixed firmly in his mind again, and besides, he, <clears throat> his night vision was coming, good old visual purple. He had, left the cat, he had let the cat in, he remembered that now. Hadn't really wanted to touch it, to pick it up and put it out end. And that was when Church's hot, furry body oiled against his ankle like a low eddy of water followed by its loathsome tail curling against his calf like a cl clutching snake. And then Lewis did scream. He opened his mouth wide and screamed. And it's the end of chapter 28, and i got a cat swirling around me. <laughs> We're on to chapter... I mean, that's the end of chapter 27. We're on to chapter 28. Okay. Daddy Ellie screamed. She ran up the jetway toward him, we weaving in and out between deplaning passengers like a quarterback on a keeper play. Most of them stood aside, grinning. Lewis was a little embarrassed by her ardor, but he felt the large, stupid grin spreading across his own face just the same. Rachel was carrying Gage in his arms, and he saw Lewis where, when Ellie shouted, Daddy yelled exuberantly and began to wriggle in Rachel's arms. She smiled a trifle warily, Lewis thought, and set him on his feet. He began to run after Ellie, his legs pumping biz busily. Daddy, daddy. Lewis had time to notice that Gage was wearing a jumper he had never seen before. It looked like more of Grandad's work to Lewis. Then Ellie hurtled into him and shinnied up like a tray. Hi, Daddy, she, he, she bellowed and smacked his cheek heartily. Hi, hun, he said and bent over to catch Gage. He pulled up into the crook of his arm and hugged them both. I'm glad to see you back. 
Rachel came up then, her traveling bag and pocketbook slung over one arm, Gage's diaper bag slung over the other. I'll be a big boy soon was printed on the other side of the diaper bag, a sentiment probably meant more to cheer up the parents than the diaper-wearing child. She looked like a professional photographer at the end of a long, grueling assignment. Lewis bent over, bent between his two kids and planted a kiss on her mouth. Hi. Hi, Doc, she said and smiled. You look beat. I am beat. We got as far as Boston with no problem. We changed planes with no problem. We took off with no problem. But as the plane is banking over the city, Gage looks down and says, Pretty, pretty, and then whoops, he's all over himself. Oh, Jesus. I got him changed in the toilet, she said. I don't think it's a virus or anything. He was just air sick. Come on. Home, Lewis said. I've got chili on the stove. Chili, chili, Ellie screamed in Lewis's ear, transported with delight and excitement. Chewy, chewy, Gage screamed in Lewis's e other ear, which at least equalized the ringing. Come on, Lewis said. Let's get your suitcases and blow this joint. Daddy, how's church? Ellie asked as he set her down. It was a question Lewis had expected, but not Ellie's anxious face and the deep worry line that appeared between her dark blue eyes. Lewis frowned and then glanced at Rachel. She woke up screaming over the weekend, Rachel said quietly. She had a nightmare. I dreamed that church got run over, Ellie said. Too many turkey sandwiches after the big day. That's my guess, Rachel said. She had a bout of diarrhea, too. Set her mind at rest, Lewis, and let's get out of this airport. <clears throat> I've seen enough airports in the last week to last me for at least five years. Why, church is fine, honey, Lewis said slowly. Yes, he's fine. He lies around the house all day long and looks at me with those strange, muddy eyes, as if he's seen something that blasts away most of whatever intelligent a cat, intelligence a cat has, and they're smarter than he thinks they are, but whatever. He's just great. I put him out with a broom at night because I don't like to touch him. I just kind of sweep at him with it, and he goes. And the other day when I opened the door, Ellie had a mouse of what was left of it. He'd strewed the guts, held a breakfast. And speaking of breakfast, I skipped mine that morning. Otherwise... He's just fine, oh, Ellie said, and that furrow between her eyes smoothed out. Oh, that's good. When I had the dream, I was sure he was dead. Were you, Lewis Assassin smiled? Dreams are funny, aren't they? Dweems, Gage hollered. He had reached the parrot stage that Lewis remembered from Ellie's development. Dweems gave Lewis's hairy, hearty tug. Come on, gang, Lewis said, and they started to the baggage area. They had gotten as far as the station wagon parking lot when Gage began saying, Pretty, pretty, in a strange, hip-cupping voice. This time he whoopsied all over Lewis, who had put on a new pair of double-knit slacks for the plane meeting's occasion. Occasion, uh, apparently, Gage thought pretty was the code word for I've got to throw up now, so sorry, stand clear. It turned out to be a virus after all. By the time they had driven the 17 miles from the Bangor airport to their house in Ludlow, Gage had begun to show signs of fever and had fallen into an uncomfortable doze. Lewis backed into the garage, and out of the corner of his eye, he saw a church slink along the wall, tail up, strange eyes fixed on the car. It disappeared into the dying <clears throat> low of the day, and a moment later, Lewis saw a disemboweled mouse lying beside a stack of four summer tires. He had, <coughs> he had the snows put on with, while Rachel and the kids were gone. The mouse's innards glowed pink and raw in the, gar in the garage's gloom. Lewis got out quickly and purposefully. <clears throat> purposely bumped against the pile of tires which were stacked up like black checkers. The top two fell over and covered the mouse. Oops, he said. You're a klutz, Daddy. Ellie said, not unkindly. Ellie said, not unkindly. That's right, Lewis said, with a kind of hectic cheer. He felt a little like saying, pretty, pretty, and blowing his groceries all over everything. Daddy's a klutz. He could remember church killing only a single rat before his queer resurrection. He sometimes courted mice and played with them in that deadly cat way that ultimately ended in destruction, but he or Ellie and Rachel had always intervened before the end. <clears throat> Once cats were fixed, he knew few of them would do more than give a mouse-interested stare, at least as long as they were well-fed. Are you going to stand there dreaming or help me with this kid, Rachel asked. Come back from planet Mongo, Dr. Creed. Earth people need you, she sounded tired and irritable. I'm sorry, babe, Lewis said. He came around to get Gage, who was now as hot as... The coals in a banked stove. So only the three of them are Lewis's fa famous. So only the three of them ate Lewis's famous South Side chili that night. Gage reclined on the living room sofa, feverish and apathetic, drinking a bottle filled with lukewarm chicken broth and watching a cartoon show on TV. After dinner, Ellie went to the garage door and called Church. 
Lewis, who was doing the dishes while Rachel unpacked upstairs, hoped the cat wouldn't come, but he did. He came in, walking in his, <coughs> his new lurch, and, and he came almost at once as if he, as if it had been lurking out there, lurking. The word came immediately to mind. Church, Ellie cried. Hi, Church. <coughs> she picked the cat up and hugged it. Lewis watched out of the corner of his eyes. Ah, his hands, which had been groping on the bottom of the sink from any leftover silverware, was still. <coughs> he saw Ellie's happy face change slowly to puzzlement. The cat lay quiet in her arms, its ears laid back, its eyes on hers. After a long moment, it seemed very long to Lewis. She put Church down. The cat patted away before... <coughs> Sorry, a little... Patted away toward the dining room without holding back. Without looking back, that is. Executioner of small mice, Lewis thought randomly. Christ, what did we do that night? He tried honestly to remember, but it already seemed far away, dim and distant. <coughs> like the messy death of Victor Pascal on the floor of the infirmary's reception room. Good drink here. He could remember carriages of wind passing in the sky and the white glimmer of snow in the back field which rose to the w woods. That was all. Daddy, Ellie said in a low, subdued voice. What, Ellie? Church smells funny, does he? Louis asked, his voice scarcely neutral. Yes, Ellie said, distressed. Yes, he does. He never smelled the funny before. He smells like, he smells like caca. That's what, what death smells like. Bad caca. Well, maybe he rolled in something bad, honey, Louis said. Whatever that bad smell is, he'll lose it. I certainly hope so. Ellie said in a comical, dowager's voice, she walked off. <coughs> Louis found the last fork, washed it, and pulled the plug. He stood at the sink, looking out into the night, while the soapy water ran down the drain with a thick, chuckling, chuckling sound. When the sound from the drain was gone, he could hear the wind outside, thin and wild, coming from the north, bringing down winter, and he realized he was afraid. Simply, stupidly afraid, the way you were afraid when a cloud suddenly sails across the sun. And somewhere you hear a ticking sound you can't account for. A hundred and three, Rachel asked. Jesus, Lou, are you sure? <coughs> it's a virus, Lewis said. He tried not to let Rachel's voice, which seemed almost accusatory, great on him. She was tired. It had been a long day for her. She had crossed half the country with their kids today. Here was eleven o'clock and the day wasn't over yet. Ellie was deeply asleep in her room. Gage was on their bed in a state that could best be described as semi-conscious. Lewis had started him on liquid print an hour ago. The aspirin will bring his fever down by morning on aspirin for children. As a doctor, you know they can get Rye disease, but whatever. <laughs> anyway. Aren't you going to give him ampicillin or anything? Patiently, Lewis said. If he had the flu or strep infection, I would. He doesn't. It's got a virus, and that stuff doesn't do doodly squat for viruses. So just give him the runs and dehydrate him more. Are you sure it isn't a, it's a virus? Well, if you want a second opinion, Lewis Snap, be my guest. You don't have to shout at me, Rachel shouted. I wasn't shouting, Lewis shouted back. <laughs> you were, Rachel began. You were, sh sh shouted. And then her mouth began to quiver. She put a hand up to her face. Lewis saw there were... Deep gray-brown pockets under her eyes and felt badly ashamed of himself. I'm sorry, he said, and sat down beside her. Christ, I don't know what's the matter with me. I apologize, Rachel. Never complain, never explain, she said, smiled wanly. Isn't that what you told me once? The trip was a bitch, and I've been afraid you'd hit the roof when you looked in Gage's dresser drawers. I guess maybe I ought to tell you now, while you're feeling sorry for me, what's to hit the roof about? She smiled wanely. My mother and father bought him ten new outfits. He was wearing one of them today. Well, I mean, that's what grandparents do. I noticed he had on something new, he said shortly. I noticed you noticing, she replied, and pulled a comic scowl that made him laugh. Although he didn't feel much like laughing, and six new dresses for Ellie. Six dresses, he said, strangling the urge to yell. He was suddenly furious, sickly furious, and hurt in a way he couldn't explain. Rachel, why? Why did you let him do that? We don't need. We can buy. He ceased. His rage and... And made there his grand their grandchildren. Fragen made him in I disagree with him on that one. Although I agree with him a lot. His rage had made him inarticulate, and for a moment he saw himself carrying Ellie's dead cat. 
through the woods, shifting the plastic bag from one hand to the other, and all the while, Erwin Goldman, that dirty old fuck from Lake Forest, been busy trying to, trying to buy his daughter's affection by unlumbering the world-famous checkbook and the world-famous fountain pen. For one moment, he felt himself on the urge of, verge of shouting. He, br he bought her six dresses, and I, I bought her, brought her a goddamn cat back from the dead, so who loves her more? He clamped down on the words. He would never say anything like that, never. She touched his neck gently. Lewis, she said. It was both of them together. Please try to see. Please. They love the children, and they don't see them much. And they're getting old, Lewis. You'd hardly recognize my father, really. I'd recognize him, Lewis muttered. Please, honey, try to see. <sighs> try to be kind. It doesn't hurt you. He looked at her for a long moment, a long time. It does, though, he said. Finally, maybe it shouldn't, but it does. She opened her mouth, no reply, and then Ellie called out from her room. Daddy, Mommy, somebody. Rachel started to get up, and Lewis pulled her back down. Stay with Gage, I'll go. He thought he knew what the trouble was, but he had put the cat out, damn it, after Ellie had gone, out, gone to bed. He had caught it in the kitchen, sniffing around his dish, and had put it out. He didn't want the cat sleeping with her, not anymore. Odd thoughts of disease, mingled memories of Uncle Carl's funeral parlor come to him when he thought of church sleeping on Ellie's bed. She's got to know that something's wrong and church was better before. He had put the cat out, but when he went in, Ellie was sitting up in bed, more asleep than wake, and church was spread out on the counterpane, a bat-like shadow. The cat's eyes were open and stupidly gleaming in the light from the hall. Daddy, put him out, Ellie almost groaned. He stinks so bad. Shh, Ellie, go to sleep, Lewis said, astounded by the calmness of his own voice. It made him think of the morning after a sleepwalking incident, the day after Pascal had died, getting to the infirmary and ducking into the bathroom to look at himself in the mirror, convinced that he must look like a hell. But he looked pretty much all right. It was enough to make you wonder how many people were going around with dread, dreadful secrets bottled up inside. It's not a secret, goddamn, it's just the cat. But Ellie was right, it stank the high heaven. He took the cat out of her room and carried it downstairs, trying to breathe through his mouth. There were worse smells, shit worse, was worse, if you want to be perfectly blunt. A month ago, they'd had a go-round with a septic tank, and as Judd had said when he came over to watch Puffer and Sons pump the tank, that ain't Chanel number no. five, is it, Lewis? The smell of a gangrenous wound. What old Dr. Braceman at med school had called hot flesh was worse, too. Even the smell which came from the Civic's catalytic converter when it had been idling in the garage for a while was worse. But this smell was pretty damn bad, and how had the cat gotten in anyway? He had put it out earlier, sweeping it out with a broom while all three of them, his people, were upstairs. This was the first time he had actually held the cat since the day it had come all back almost a week ago. It lay hotly in his arms like a quiescent disease, quiescent disease, disease. That's pretty good. and Lewis wondered, what bolt hole did you find, you bastard? He thought suddenly of his dream the other night. Pasco simply passed the door between the kitchen and the garage. Maybe there was no bolt hole. Maybe it just passed the door like a ghost. Bag that, he whispered aloud. His voice was slightly hoarse. Lewis became suddenly sure that the cat would begin to struggle in his arms, that it would scratch him, but Churchly, totally still, radiating that stupid heat and that dirty stink, looking at Lewis's face as if it could read the thoughts going on behind Lewis's eyes. He opened the door and tossed the cat out into the garage, maybe a little too hard. Go on, he said, kill another mouse or something. Church landed awkwardly, at tying quarters bunching beneath it. And momentarily collapsing, it seemed to shoot Lewis a look of green, ugly hate, then it strolled drunkenly off and was gone. Christ, Judd, he thought, but I wish you'd kept your mouth shut. He went to the sink and washed his hands and forearms vigorously as if scrubbing for an operation. You do it because it gets hold of you. You make up reasons. They seem like good reasons. But mostly you do it because once you've been up there... It's your place, and you belong to it, and you make up the sweetest smelling reasons in the world. No, he couldn't blame Judd. He had gone off his, of his own free will, and he couldn't blame Judd. He turned off the water and began to dry his hands and arms. Suddenly, the towel stopped moving, and he stared straight ahead, looking out at the little piece of night framed in the window over the sink. Does that mean it's my place now? Does that It's mine, too? No, not if I don't want it to be. He slung the towel over the rack and went upstairs. Rachel... 
was in bed. The covers pulled up to her chin and Gage was tucked in neatly beside her. She looked at Lewis apologetically. Would you mind, hon? Just for tonight. I'd feel better having him with me. He's so hot. No, Lewis said, that's fine. I'll pull, I'll pull, I'll pull out the hide of bed downstairs. You really don't mind? No, it won't hurt Gage. It'll make you feel better. He paused and smiled. You're going to pick up his vi virus, though. That comes almost guaranteed. I don't suppose that changes your mind, does it? That's a mother, though. She smiled back and shook his, her head. What was Ellie fussing about? Church. She wanted me to take church away. Ellie wanted church to take it away? That's a switch. Yeah, it is, Lewis agreed and then added. She said he smelled bad, and I did think he was a little fragrant. Maybe rolled in a pile of someone's mulch or something. That's too bad, Rachel said, rolling over on her side. I really think Ellie missed church as much as she missed you. Uh-huh, Lewis said. He bent and kissed her mouth softly. Go to sleep, Rachel. I love you, Lou. I'm glad to be home, and I'm sorry about the couch. It's okay, Lewis, and turned out the light. Downstairs, he stacked the couch cushions, pulled out the hider bed, and tried to prepare himself mentally for a night of having the rod under the thin mattress dig into the small of his back. The bed was sheeted, at least. He wouldn't have to make it up from scratch. Lewis got two blankets from the top shelf in the front hall and spread them on the bed. He began to undress them, paused. Do you think church is in again? Fine. Take a walk around and have a look. As you told Rachel, it won't hurt. May, may even help. And checking out to make sure all the doors are on the latch won't even catch you a virus. He took a deliberate tour of the tire downstairs, checking the locks and doors and windows. He had done everything right the first time. Church was nowhere to be seen. There he said, let's see you get in tonight, you dumb cat. <laughs> Followed this with a mental wish that Church would freeze and its balls off, except that Church, of course, no longer had any. He switched off the lights and got into bed. The rod started to press into his back almost immediately, and Lewis was thinking he would be awake half the night when he fell asleep. He fell asleep resting uncomfortably on his side in the hide bed But when he woke up, he was in the burying ground beyond the pet cemetery again. This time he was alone. He had killed Church himself this time. And then had decided for some reason to bring him back to life a second time. God knew why. Why? Lewis didn't. He had buried Church deeper this time, though. Church couldn't dig his way out. Lewis couldn't hear the cat crying somewhere under the earth, making a sound like a weeping child. This, the sound came up through the pores of the ground, through its stony flesh. The wand, the sound, excuse me, and the smell, that awful, sickish, sweet smell of a rat, of rotten decay, just breathing it in made his chest feel heavy as if a weight was on it. The crying, the crying. The crying was still going on, and the weight was still on his chest. Lewis, it was Rachel, and, the son, and she sounded alarmed. Lewis, can you come? She sounded more than alarmed. She sounded scared. The crying had a choked, desperate quality to it. It was Gage. He opened his eyes and stared into Church's greenish-yellow eyes. They were less than four inches from his own. The cat was on his chest, nearly, neatly curled up there like something from the old wives' tale of, breathing, of breath-stealing. The stink came off in... It in slow, noxious waves, it was purring. Lewis uttered a cry of disgust and surprise. He shot both hands on a primitive, warding off gesture. Church slumped off the bed, landed on its side, and walked away in that stumbling lurch. Jesus, Jesus, it was on me. Oh, God, it was right on me. His disgust could not be greater if he had wakened to find a spider in his mouth. For a moment, he thought he was going to throw up. Lewis, he pushed the blankets back and stumbled to the stairs. Faint light spilled from the bedroom. Rachel was standing at the bed uh, of the stairs in her bed in her nightgown. Lewis, he's vomiting again, choking on it. I'm scared. I'm here, he said, and came up to her, thinking. It got in. Somehow it got in from the cellar, probably. Maybe there's a broken cellar window. In fact, there must be a broken window down there. I'll check it tomorrow when I get home. Hell, before I go to work, I'll... Gage stopped crying and began to make an ugly, gurgling, choking sound. Lewis, Rachel screamed. Lewis moved fast. Gage was on his side and vomit was trickling out of his mouth onto an old towel Rachel had spread beside him. He was vomiting, yes, but not enough. Most of it was inside and Gage was blushing with the onset of asphyxiation. Lewis grabbed the boy under the arms, aware in a distant way of how hot his son's armpits were under the Dr. Denton suit and put him on his shoulder as if to burp him. Then Lewis snapped himself backward, jerking Gage with him. Gage's neck whiplashed. He uttered a loud bark that was not quite a belt, and an amazing flag of almost solid vomit flew from his mouth. 
and spouted on the floor on the dresser. Gage began to cry again, a solid bawling sound that was music to Lewis's ear. To cry like that, you had to be getting an unlimited supply of oxygen. Rachel's knees buckled and she collapsed onto the bed. Head supported in her hand, she was shaking violently. He almost died, didn't he, Lewis? He almost... Ch 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 oh, my God. Lewis walked around the room with his son his arm in his arms. Gage's cries were tapering off to whimpers, whimperings. He was already almost asleep again. The chances are 50 to 1 he would have cleared it himself, Rachel. I just gave him a hand. But he was close, she said. She looked up at him and her white ringed eyes were stunned and unbelieving. Lewis, he was so close. Suddenly, he remembered her shouting at him in the sunny kitchen. He's not going to die. No one is going to die around here, honey. Honey, Lewis said, we're all close, all the time. It was milk that had almost surely caused a fresh round of vomiting. <clears throat> Gage had wakened around midnight, she said, an hour or so after Lewis had gone to sleep with his hungry cry, and Rachel had gotten him a bottle. She had drowsed off again herself while he was taking it, but an hour later, the choking spell began. No more milk, Lewis said, and Rachel had agreed almost humbly, no more milk. Lewis got back downstairs at around a quarter of two and spent 15 minute, minutes hunting up the cat. During his search, he found the door which communicated between the kitchen and basement standing ajar, as he suspected he would. He remembered his mother telling him about a cat that had gotten quite good at pawing open old-fashioned latches such as the one on their cellar door. The cat would just climb the edge of the door, she'd said, and pat the thumb plate off of the latch with its paw until the door opened. A cute enough trick, Lewis thought but not uh, one he intended to allow Church to practice often. There was, after all, a lock on the cellar door, too. He found Church dozing under the stove and tossed it out the front door without ceremony. On his way back to the hide bed he closed the cellar door again and this time shot the bolt. It's the end of chapter 28. Let me see if we're going to... No, I'll chapter 29 because that's short. Chapter 29. In the morning, Gage's temperature was almost normal. His cheeks were chapped, but otherwise he was bright-eyed and full of beans. All at once, in the course of a week, it seemed, his meaningless gabble had turned into a slew of words. He would imitate almost anything you said. <clears throat> what Ellie wanted him to say was, shit. <laughs> say shit, Gage, Ellie said over her oatmeal. Shit, Gage. Gage responded agreeably over his own cereal. cereal. Lewis allowed cereal on condition that Gage eat it with only a little sugar, and as usual, Gage seemed to be shampooing with it rather than actually eating it. Ellie dissolved into giggles. Say farts, Gage, she said. Fars, Gage, Gage said, grinning through the oatmeal spread across his face. Fars and shit, Ellie and Lewis broke up. It was impossible not to. Rachel was not so amused. That's enough vulgar talk for one morning, I think, she said, handing Lewis's eggs. Shit, and fars and fars and shit, Gage sang cheerfully, and Ellie hit her giggles in her hands. Rachel's mouth twitched a little. <clears throat> Lewis thought she was looking a hundred percent better in spite of her broken rest. A lot of it was relief, Lewis supposed. Gage was better and she was home. Don't say that, Gage, Rachel said. Pretty, Gage had as a <clears throat> change of pace and threw up all the cereal he had eaten to his bowl. Oh, gross out, Ellie screamed and fled the table. Lewis broke up completely then. He couldn't help it. He laughed until he was crying and cried until he was laughing and Rachel and Gage stared at him as if he had gone crazy. No, Lewis could have told them. I've been crazy, but I think I'm going to be all right now. I really think I am. He didn't know if it was over or not, but if it felt over, perhaps that would be enough. And for a while, at least it was. And it's the end of chapter 29 on to, and we're going to get into chapter 30 in the next video. Little shorter video tonight. But that's okay. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, the notification bell, and check me out next time with me and all my four little free lines. <laughs> Jamie, Lily, Jamie, Lily, Bella, and Chloe. Chloe. Yeah. Good night. Stay safe and healthy.